All right, so folks, thank you all for joining us today. We want to make sure we have enough time to, to get started. Um, as Stu talked about, yes, today we are going to talk about designing networks for warehouses. And so we're very excited to have the guests that we do today. Um, I'll kick it off. Um, so we have Jen, uh, who's joining us. Jen, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, and then we'll uh, allow JD to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Jennifer Huber, a mobility solutions architect for Worldwide Technology. You can find me on Twitter, Jennifer Lucille. I've been doing Wi-Fi for a long time now. I don't want to count. <laughs> <laughs> and Jen is a yoga guru, amazing yes. person. If you've ever had an opportunity to be at a conference with Jen, she leads a yoga session in the mornings when we can. Um, and Jen is phenomenal. I have audio classes online at gentechyoga.com. Yes. And uh, JD, we have a, uh, for those of you who don't, I don't, I've never, I don't think I've ever actually called you Jonathan or John. Like, he's just JD. Yeah, just JD. Works great for me. Um, I know some people wonder what it stands for, so I generally put it out there. I saw someone mention uh, a corn singer, and, and they're, they're, we're, I tell people we're a dime a dozen. There's so many Jonathan Davises in the world that uh, have to be known as something else. Um, in a previous role I was actually one of five Jonathans within earshot of each other so uh, JD was the nickname that I picked up in my career and and that's and I've just ran with it gotcha awesome well welcome uh, Jen and JD we're really excited to have you and so this episode I say episode this webinar topic actually came about we had um, some folks come on the show and talk about designing networks with external antennas. And we had so many questions surrounding warehouses mm -hmm. and a lot of things that were happening and just warehouses in general, not necessarily just dedicated to external antennas. So what we thought we would do is invite some other folks to come on and onto the webinar and talk to us about warehousing. So Jen and JD, thank you for joining us. So specifically warehouses, um, Jen, why don't we start with you? What makes a warehouse environment so challenging? Well, the primary thing that makes warehouses so challenging is that the stuff that's on the shelves in the warehouses is changing from hour to hour, day to day, week to week. And it's even possible that the shelving itself could change or be moved or added to. Awesome. Just, just, for, just for starters. Yeah, well, we're going to get into a lot of that. Jenny, yeah. what do you think is, a, is one of the most challenging environments or things about a warehouse environment? Well, I think I, I think really Jen hit it on the on the head there. Um, it's not just it, and, and it's not just the fact that stock levels are changing, but the things that are stock may change, and some of those things may be highly absorptive to to RF, and other things may be highly reflective. If you have paper, for example, it it absorbs RF uh, like a sponge. If you have uh, 11 liter uh, engine blocks sitting there, they're highly reflective, right? So um, so it's not just a matter of the, the levels uh, changing and, and where that stuff uh, resides, but also, um, but also the, the different characteristics of every component that goes into that warehouse. Yeah, and I think too, um, Jesse pointed out on the chat, that that's another thing, not just the inventory levels that are in there, but you've got metal racks that are housing stuff, you've got machinery that's coming in, you've got I-beams in the ceiling, the construction of it, there's a lot of concrete, there's just a lot of metal in general in warehouses that creates a challenge versus something like an enterprise building where you've got carpet space or tile or desks. I mean, it, it's just a very different type of environment. So we've got all of that. So specifically talking about, um, Jen, some of the layout. So talk to us about what you typically see in a warehouse from a, uh, a like a layout perspective. What do, I mean, we know narrow aisles, but what do you do we typically see for networking that you, the things you need to look out for? Uh, the things that you need to look out for are length of cable runs, first of all, because you may need to get Wi-Fi to a place where there's not an IDF. So you may find yourself having to put uh, a rack up on a wall so that you can put a switch to extend the length mm -hmm. of cabling. Um, but you also find issues where there's layers within layers. So there's like the floor to ceiling, maybe 35, 40 feet, but you may have a two story of the, the metal mesh to create a second story for extra storage. And it's sometimes tricky to get RF in that area just because of all of the, the metal inter interfering. Mm -hmm. And JD, what about you? What, uh, what uh, addition to what Jen's talking about, what else do you see that 
things that you need to look out for? Um, well, one of the one of the major things, actually, I'm going to go to, with two, because <laughs> there's two that really, I, I think, impact a lot of people, and, and often they don't realize it. Um, roaming in a warehouse is, mm -hmm. is often very high speed, um, especially when you start looking at um, operators on forklifts or tow motors, whatever you would like to, to call those. Um, they, they move very quickly, and especially when they're, say, turning corners and, and shooting down aisles at high speed, those rooms are really difficult, and there's a lot of thought and process that has to go into ensuring that once that, once that forklift has made that, that turn, that there's an, ac there's, there's an access point there for it to roam to, but it's the right access point for mm -hmm. that area, right? So if you, if you make that turn and you've got um, you know, seven possible roam candidates uh, to go to, it's really easy to um, it's really easy for that device to potentially roam to a can uh, to 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 an access point that is immediately no longer available. Um, so that's that's probably the the one of the hardest things. And the other aspect is is warehouses like almost no other facility have to be designed 3D, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about our traditional design, you're, you're looking at that top-down view um, and, and you, basically the design is, is built for, I believe with Echo How, it's 40 inches off the floor, if I remember off the top of my head. Um, and which is, which, is a, which is a great number for desktops, right? It's a great number for carpeted office space. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at, um, when you start looking in warehouses, um, there are a lot of warehouses where the operator, especially if it's very tall racking, the operator actually rides with the forks. So the mm -hmm. operator themselves and the computer they're using, whether it's a handheld or mounted uh, PC, may actually go up 30 or 40 feet. And so now if you're planning for RF at 40 inches off the ground, you may realize once you're up 35 feet in the air that you no longer have the RF coverage that, 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 uh, that you need. So I think those are kind of the two big ones. Okay. Yeah, you know, that brings out a good one because when you're in that owner operator, I witnessed this recently in a, in a large distribution center where um, they're now placing the uh, customized tablets right up above the driver uh, mm -hmm. on the actual pillar of that fork, you know, we'll call it forklift, right, to you. And so it's it's actually sitting right there and it's it's encased in uh, a huge amount of, you know, um, silicone or rubber dampening, right? And so you, you now have to think about, okay, so this device is now encapsulated in another device and it's being constrained by two metal poles beside it and it's moving fast. And like you say, JD, it's like when you come around that corner, you need to account for, um, that angle of arrival from that client to the, to the next AP, right? And to make sure that we can, you know, not getting into doing um, location services, but having on that same um, thinking of that, if you're going to make sure roam, make sure you've got, you're enabled to, um, to, to roam to that next AP efficiently, right? Yeah. Um, so let's specifically talk about external antennas. I mean, we know you can use an internal integrated AP in a warehouse, but typically you do see external antennas because of the type of environment, because of the narrow aisles and how you have to get the RF to where it needs to be, where the client devices are going to be. So um, JD, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, things with external antennas. Um, I'm just going to kind of let you talk because JD is one of the, uh, is an antenna guru. I don't know that I would use the term guru, but I'm passionate <laughs> about it at least. Uh, I love this aspect. I love RF, and, and that's the reason I love Wi-Fi. Um, so I've actually, I've been in warehouses where mm -hmm. the first attempt at Wi-Fi in that warehouse was uh, internal antennas at the ceiling. And especially, again, when looking at, um, when looking at that 30-foot ceiling um, as kind of a standard, you know, ceiling height uh, to consider, uh, you're actually putting yourself pretty far up there. Um, it's not, that's not the way those access points are designed uh, to operate. Um, and you're, you're actually putting yourself in a situation where unless you are looking at a whole lot of that, that, um, that higher uh, use in, you know, higher up in the racks, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably not the best solution. Um, you're also now looking at, um, in that situation, putting access points down the aisles and, and, and again, forcing more roams, 
which a lot of um, a lot of devices that are used in warehouses may not have the best roaming algorithms in place. Mm -hmm. So ideally, now what the the best thing to do really is to begin looking at um, actually using patch antennas to to really shape that coverage and ensure that you're providing um, as much coverage as you can on that access point. Um, getting your your uh, signal level up, obviously, with a little bit of dB gain. Um, that's bi-directional because it's antenna based and not, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not coming out of amplifier. Um, so you're, you're, you're getting better receive sensitivity um, and ensuring that um, you are uh, shaping that signal in a way so that you're not really having a, a lot of uh, coach channel con contention. So that's going to be a big thing. Um, you know, I talked, so when it comes to antenna polarity, I talked about this at WLPC last year um, in 2019. Um, I was working a very large warehouse and um, doing exactly this, right? External patch antennas, end of the aisle, shooting down these really long aisles. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, um, the math wasn't adding up, right? And I was, I was really kind of trying to figure out why I was getting um, less signal on the floor um, than I was expecting based on a location. And it was a significant amount. It was about 20 dB difference. Mm -hmm. And what I, through stumbling through this, and this was a little bit earlier in my career, I, I came to that realization and realized that um, what I was saying was the beacon. And on most devices, the beacon goes out the first antenna radio chain. So in this case, I was using Cisco. So it was going out that uh, radio chain A or radio chain one, I forget what it was back then. But um, but I had taken a, a, a wide patch antenna that, that has a very wide uh, beam width and I had turned it 90 degrees and, and pointed mm -hmm. and tilted it down so that it, it, would, it would shoot down the long aisle, provide mm -hmm. that coverage down that long aisle without putting any signal into the, into the racks, actually mm -hmm. into the racks so that the next aisle over there was minimal signal. Well, when I did that, right, that first, uh, because it was a um, dual polarized antenna, that first radio chain that normally would be vertically uh, polarized has now been horizontally polarized. So every time a, uh, every time a beacon, anything that was, that, that, you know, was, was sent out to all clients, so beacons, anything along those lines was, was sent, it was sent out only through that first radio chain when we couldn't do, you know, MRC or any, anything along those lines. And for that reason, especially to roams, it was slowing roams down because the, the signal wasn't as high as it should have been. By simply swapping the antenna, it was, it was funny because it, whenever, when the, the light bulb came on, it was definitely one of those aha moments. Mm -hmm. Swap the antenna lug from, for that first, or, or uh, for that first radio chain to what was now a vertically polarized antenna, and I immediately saw that, that DB gain jump. So it's, it's, those, it's those things like that you have to be careful of. Uh, obviously, cable length, when we start talking about adding cable length, as long as we keep or keeping those cables fairly short, we, we don't have too much to worry about. Um, but uh, but I have been in warehouses where I've saw, saw you know, 100 feet of, of uh, LMR 400, where you've got 50 of it coiled up, um, you know, by the access point. And, and when you start looking at that distance and you look at the connector loss, and now you're, now you're shooting yourself in the foot, not just because of... Um, obviously your transmit power, but, but again, going back to that whole receive sensitivity of the access point. Uh, and um, so there's, there's some real issues that kind of come from that. So I'm, I'm, I always tell people run that, run that, <laughs> run that network cable to the absolute 100 meters. If you have to, that's, that's fine, but do not put those really long antenna cables on there. Um, that's, that's the best way of kind of ruining a design. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then again, I mean, kind of going back to uh, those, those, the, the benefits of uh, using external antennas is you really get to be choosy and picky about um, what, what pattern you use in what locations, whether it's a, whether it's a patch up at the ceiling pointing straight down in an area, maybe a small parts area where people are mostly local and things along those lines mm -hmm. to ensure that you're getting that signal at the floor that you would lose if it was an internal access point or shooting, you know, shooting down aisles and, and, and those things. So I think, uh, I think that's probably the, the biggest, those are probably the biggest uh, uh, mistakes I've seen in, in warehouses. So Jen, um, I know cable length was something important to you. What, um, have you been able to find any creative ways to manage that or for mounting purposes? What are some of the, the ways you've solved for that type of problem? 
Um, like, um, like I briefly mentioned, I mean, I've seen uh, additional IDFs have to be added into mm -hmm. areas in warehouses, which could just be a simple um, rack mount on the wall with a switch and some uh, POE mm -hmm. for the APs in order to extend RF into an area, maybe where the previous design had planned for a really high gain antenna and mm -hmm. they decided, you know, that that wasn't uh, ideal. Um, I've seen warehouses that were done where the, the wireless um, designer created this situation where they were splitting antennas like so they they thought that they were if they took one antenna and they put it on a splitter and they pointed it two different directions that they'd be doubling their coverage not understanding that um this was back in the day where the ap would switch between the two antenna options and send on one and then the other mm -hmm. so they're basically creating themselves like a huge coverage hole intermittently mm -hmm. Um, I've seen things where people would split an antenna and put one inside a freezer and one outside the freezer, again, creating additional coverage holes. Um, but uh, with cable link, yeah, you may have more IDFs uh, in future than you currently have now in order to do a pervasive wireless design. Mm -hmm. um, things like that will be uncovered as you start to plan for more APs and where the AP should go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, yep. and what about, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stu. Oh, that was Judy. Yep, sorry, I'll, I'll jump in there. And I, sure. I think uh, Jen makes a great point on IDF placement. That's, a, that's, that's one of those things that has to be considered just like antenna or AP mm -hmm. placement. Um, you really have to be careful about where you put those You're IDFs put because you want to be able to, wall, yeah, you want to be able to service to them later, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I went into a warehouse, um, um, this was, you know, several years back. Um, and thought I, I, I'd not really worked through the whole IDF placement thing before. And so I got in, the IDFs had been installed exactly as I had requested. Uh, everything was really working. Actually, I had literally one access point that was, that was causing a problem. Um, had to go to the switch to check the patch cable. And it took me three hours before I could get someone to move all of the, the racks that had been installed below, uh, you know, the racks of, of, of stuff that was in storage mm -hmm. that had been installed under that IDF. So, mm -hmm. and, and that was so that I could then get the lift in to do the work I needed to do. Yeah. So, so there's, there's also a lot of thought when, you, when you're doing the, these designs, a lot of thought needs to go into where those IDFs get placed mm -hmm. to ensure that you'll always have that access, especially, I mean, you know, if, if it had been something more serious, if it had been a switch that had died, you know, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly we've got, you know, 35 access access points, um, you know, that are no longer, um, uh, you know, up and operating on the, in, in the environment, mm -hmm. obviously, I would have had a lot more, I would have had someone scrambling to help me. Um, mm -hmm. But that's still one of those situations where every time I had to access that I was going to have to get someone to move um, um, racks of racks of stuff, you know, with a forklift before I could ever actually access it. So that's, that's an important thought there that I don't think, uh, I don't think I captured in any of my notes for this. Nothing one interest. Yeah, one interesting, yeah, just real quick, one interesting thing I saw for um, uh, a solution so you could access the AP if you ever needed to swap out an AP because it died was that I had a customer who installed uh, external antennas at the recommended mounting height or what have you, but at the base of every uh, antenna installation is where the actual AP was so that they ran a length of cable and I know that you get lost with that, but all of the APs were easily accessible without having to get up on a scissor lift if anything died. So that was yeah, because that, that, that can be a huge yeah. um, time thing trying to mm -hmm. get a scissor mm -hmm. lift and it may not be available. And then you have to get mm -hmm. the person that's certified mm -hmm. to actually get on that thing to go up there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so someone asked a question, uh, Jen, and I'm going to pose this to you. Uh, for large open warehouses, such as a production floor with high ceilings, but not high equipment or shelving, how do you combat? the 2.4 channel interference with your network when you are implementing both the 2.4 and five gigahertz coverage? Well, you have to turn off intermittent APs, you know, or turn, turn your power down, turn off ones that are creating more co-channel interference than they're providing good coverage for. I would say use directional antennas at the ends of the aisles um, to and aim the RF down to where the, the people are. Mm -hmm. You may end up having APs hung, suspended from cables at the ends of aisles rather than mounted on the walls so mm -hmm. that you can aim the RF down through the aisles and uh, also have an AP installation so that if it gets hit with a uh, forklift or what have you, that it can actually swing out of the way instead of get broken. 
Okay, so if it's hanging off a piece mm -hmm. of rigid conduit and a junction box, something's going to give and it's going to break and you're going to be with a Wi-Fi outage while you get it fixed. But I've seen really creative installations where things are hung from cables so that they can tolerate being smacked around. Okay. Uh, and actually, I'm going to pose this question to both Jen and JD, so be ready. And have, just kidding. Um, so for a freezer warehouse, would you recommend an integrated internal antenna or would you recommend an external antenna? Why and why not? I would recommend having some sort of access, like there's probably lighting, there's probably already an access port into the freezer. I would say use an external antenna and put the antenna on the inside of the freezer and let the AT hardware be outside the freezer. Okay. That's what uh, I Yeah, say. I absolutely agree with that. Any, anytime that's a possibility, that's, that's exactly what should take place. Um, if, you, um, if that's not a possibility for whatever reason, um, then, you know, consider, you know, some type of uh, protected um, enclosure inside um, and then where you're only running a network cable through. Yeah. Um, I really, there, I've seen plenty of other ways people have tried to work around freezers and none of them are, are, um, are something that I would want to do, right? There may be situations where I had to do it, but, but those two options are the only ones that I really see that I, I would feel, I would walk away feeling good about it. And, and I, I mean, before we move on, because I want to make sure we get to all of our content, because um, these are really good questions that folks are asking. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I would suggest specifically for warehouses too, is when you are doing your, you have your predictive design, make sure you validate and you do a survey to ensure that your coverage pattern for your antenna is performing as it's designed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see Jen is like laughing yeah. and giggling. Yeah. Um, yes. But that's one of the things that's really, really critical. And, and you have to do a physical on-site survey in that regard um, it, 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 in order to make sure that your, your deployment is, 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 or your network is gonna perform as, as it's being deployed. And I would do that prior to deployment. I would not do it post. I would, uh, that, I would make that recommendation. If, if you don't do it prior, you will do it post. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, you will, yes. Yeah, you will have that's, an issue. With yeah, that, yes. that's when you discover those problems like polarization yeah. or, or run yeah. issues, things along those lines. So, and, yeah, you, and, you will do it. It's just a question yeah. of whether or not you're going to do yeah. it with someone breathing down your neck. Right, and, and, and this is good because it uh, we're getting questions based on the photo in the slide there. Mm -hmm. And that's showing a omnidirectional um, in a kind of a, in a warehouse situation. Now, mm -hmm. the picture doesn't show the entire warehouse. So it is a depends because it right. depends on whether you could use it in that scenario. But yes, in a warehouse, you might want to actually consider a more directional AP depending on the situation, whether down the aisle. So yeah, so, so some of the questions in there, yes, in the warehouses, it depends on where in the warehouse, right? Mm -hmm. Omnidirectionals may not perform well way up in the rafters obviously for obvious mm -hmm. reasons you need to get that signal down to where the clients are so right. it is a it is a each case by case to understand mm -hmm. um and you have to be creative um like uh, you know jen and jonathan jd are saying is that you have to be creative and understand and you're going to know how your ap is going to um perform when you do that post analysis survey right because the tools yeah. will allow you to um, and uh, in Pro, it allows you to see, visualize mm -hmm. what the antenna is doing, right? Yeah. And I think, too, um, that's why it's, it's so important to make sure you understand what is happening with the inventory levels, with seasonality, with everything else as you're doing your survey so that, for example, like Jen was talking about earlier, it can change minute to minute, hour to hour. And so you've got to make sure that your network is consistent and the performance is going to be consistent for the client devices. So, uh, so moving on a little bit from antennas, I know that there are other design considerations. Um, Jen, uh, I'm going to start with you. One of the things that you were talking about um, that before the webinar started is is the configuration going to change? And I know JD alluded to some of that with the IDF issues that he was having to try to get access. Um, what uh, what would you recommend for um, arrangements, shelving arrangements that are going to change constantly? 
Um, well, shelving arrangements that are going to change constantly may force you into using omnidirectional antennas. Mm -hmm. Because if you do a really tight design with directional antennas, you're basically assuming that the shelves are never going to change their locations. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you set it up so that you're shooting down the aisles and everything's all nice and pretty, and then say, for example, like over the weekend or over a downtime, like everything's changed so the shelves are going a different way, well, now nothing is going to work. Mm -hmm. because you've designed for a, a hard, fast arrangement that has now become fluid, mm -hmm. and therefore you have lots of coverage holes or things that need to be reworked substantially. Um, so I've seen, I've seen situations like that where it's been better to be, um, to be less warehousey and more omnidirectional antennas. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, really it really depends. I mean, I don't know if there are a uh, warehouse like standard operating procedures where you can get the warehouse to say this shelving will never change mm -hmm. ever. And if it does, it's on us. It's You're, like, lucky. You're lucky. I don't know that that's even possible. Yeah. You know, I well, don't know you, that that's you, even possible. Well, what you think <laughs> about some areas in large distribution centers where they would store refrigerators uh, that are being shipped out or dishwashers and they stack them like three or four high. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they sometimes change them and to, to better suit, you know, logistical purposes. Right. And so, yeah, you could be pointing down an aisle and you think, yeah, no, they always do it this way. And then all of a sudden it changes. Right. And yep. now it's like you say, it's a, it's their um, moving target. And so you have to kind of be creative. JD, what about you? What other uh, design considerations do you think um, need to be taken into account when you're doing your predictive and your design? Um, well, let me ask this. Are we specifically talking about those warehouses that move or just any in? Any in general. So okay. let's talk about, I mean, you can talk about both. Okay. Uh, you know, I think uh, Jen really hit it uh, on the head, even though she didn't say it directly. This is definitely one of those times where we have to practice our soft skills and we have to have conversations with those warehouse yep. managers and, and both, uh, both beforehand and after and say, okay, I need to understand how often this is going to change. I need to understand, um, you know, is this something that's going to be set in stone for the next three years or is this something that you guys may decide to turn 90 degrees and move three feet to the left next weekend just because. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in my experience, uh, working with a very large international uh, manufacturer, um, after, after working through that process with a couple of them, what we mm -hmm. began to do is go, okay, these, you know, this, this, this 40% of the warehouse is going to be stuff that it's going to be number one lower. It's not going to be metal racks all the way to the ceiling. And that may move around a whole lot. That may shift a whole lot. Mm -hmm. This, this high rack area, that's going to always be high racking. And, 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 and they actually signed off and said, we understand that if we change high racking, it means you have to come back out and, and, and we have to, you know, readdress this. Mm -hmm. um, once that, once that understanding was in place, that really helped my, helped my job a whole lot. Um, that, the exact person I have in mind, in fact, maybe three months before I got a phone call on a Thursday, you know, around 4.30 and was informed that Friday morning I was driving, you know, leaving at 3 a.m. to be somewhere at 8, you know, somewhere at 8 a.m. to mm -hmm. work on, a, you know, an absolute production stopping problem. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's the end of the world because Wi-Fi doesn't work in this area. And I get there and I'm trying to figure out, you know, I didn't have good documentation. It was a, uh, it was one of the very first things I did there several months before. And, um, uh, you know, I'm kind of looking around going, I don't understand why I did it this way. And then I started looking at the floor and realized there were, I found metal shavings by some bolts. And I asked the guy, I just happened to ask the guy, I was like, did you guys move this? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. Two weekends ago. And they they'd literally turned everything 90 degrees and shifted it maybe 10 feet. Um, and, <laughs> Nice. And, and it was like, of course it doesn't work. And why am I here? And why, you know, because I'm <laughs> sleep deprived and, you know, like, ah, <laughs> so, I, so I had to, I had to Fantastic. practice some of those soft skills and, and spend a little time, uh, spend a little time showing them kind of a before and after. Uh, and, and, and once they understood that, mm -hmm. once they understood it, they ended up, I probably spent 60% of my billable hours with them. Uh, because they were always making changes. But once they understood that, you mm -hmm. know, the changes required RF changes, then, uh, you know, it worked, went well. So I would say always practice soft skills there. Um, moving on to the other design considerations, 
you got to really, you have to know the devices that are going to be in use and you got to, you have to know um, kind of what their capabilities are. Mm -hmm. uh, there was actually a great, uh, great question earlier that goes back to, to my conversation regarding um, uh, antenna polarization. Um, looking for it now. David Orr asked, um, you know, that <coughs> a lot of times, you know, those devices um, based on antennas, you know, if the person's holding it this way versus holding it this way, it's now mm -hmm. cross polarized, right? Uh, and, and that's a great point. What you'll what you'll generally see in most clients, though, is you're going to see a, a generally it's going to be a 2.2 dBi dipole if it's external. Uh, if it's internal, it may even be it, it's likely even less than that. Um, one of the things I mentioned in um, in my talk a couple of years ago was iPhones. If you actually look uh, and 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 go into it, they actually have a negative dB antenna. And the reason for that is, is because they're trying to be as close to that isotropic coverage as possible, right? So that it doesn't matter what direction you turn it, it doesn't change the, that signal propagation. Um, it goes back to the old, um, uh, especially in the old analog days, you know, you had your cell phone and, and literally, you know, doing this versus this mattered. You know, you had the antenna that you pulled out and all, right, all of that mattered, right? Mm -hmm. um, they've kind of, the, the magic that they, uh, some of the magic they've done there is by um, uh, is by ensuring that that it, you know that device is um, um, not as sensitive to that to that polarization. The mm -hmm. other thing is is when that device is transmitting and receiving data. We're talking data frames here, not uh, not management frames. Um, mm -hmm. That is happening with you know at least MRC, if not some type of of, of MIMO, right? So with that in mind, now we can use all of the radio chains and um, uh, or at least some of the radio chains, uh, and uh, and we don't have that loss um, that mm -hmm. we get on beacons where it's only a single um, antenna broadcasting. So mm -hmm. that's the type of thing um, that you have to take in mind. You have to look at what those what the capabilities of those devices are, um, what their roam settings are. Going back to to beat that dead cat, mm -hmm. but um, um, what the um, you know, obviously what, what frequencies, there's no use designing mm -hmm. a, a five gigahertz uh, warehouse uh, if all of your devices are 2.4. And trust me, there are still major manufacturers out there selling 2.4 only devices for warehouses. Barcode scanners. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and then you really have to, you really have to pay attention to, um, uh, to the firmware. Um, the differences in firmware, you know, sometimes you'll have a, uh, you know, firmware version where that device works perfectly and, and one dot revision off and that device won't even connect to the network um, or, or, you know, suddenly becomes very sticky mm -hmm. and doesn't want to roam or, or whatever. So there's a very, uh, you have to really pay attention to that stuff. Um, what else? Uh, what do you think, Jen? I, I was going to, I have a question. I mean, actually, someone else has this question, but I'm going to pose it. I'm going to pose it to Jen. What would you suggest in um, facilities that have really high ceilings, like 50 feet or above? Um, I would say in situations yeah. like that, uh, you're going to find yourself mounting the antenna and the AP in separate places because you don't want your antenna to be too high uh, because if your antenna is too high, you could potentially have coverage holes at the ground level where your devices are. This is assuming that your devices that are connecting to the Wi-Fi connect at ground level and at higher levels. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you have to have like the, the whole comprehensive on like, what are the devices that you're using? Where are they going to be used at in the 3d space? Um, does uh, an omnidirectional antenna suit your purpose? And if so, what's the footprint of that omnidirectional antenna when your AP is powered at a given power? Um, yeah, there's, there's so many things to consider and you really have to have conversations with all of the, the stakeholders in the warehouse, the end users of the devices so that you can get an understanding for how the wearable devices are worn and uh, how much blocking of the human body is gonna take place if it's a wearable on your arm mm -hmm. or on your wrist. Like, is that inside you know, uh, a forklift kind of thing, or is it just humans putting arms in shelves? Like, I mean, where is the device connecting? How is it connecting? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of it. It depends. There's a lot of yeah. it. <laughs> it really, yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing, and we kind of touched on it earlier, and I think um, what Jen said there kind of uh, triggered my, my head. Sometimes it's also a matter of asking uh, the, the customer to maybe augment the client a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. So with fork, forklift mounted PCs, you know, Stu brought it up earlier. A lot of times those mm -hmm. things get mounted in a way where they're right up against um, some very heavy metal because they've got obviously the protective cages around forklifts. Mm -hmm. um, and that can create nulls in their coverage. It can create all kinds of problems. A lot of those devices also have uh, antenna lugs. They have SMA antenna lugs or RPSMA antenna lugs. And, and if you can put an ax or put an antenna on top of or antennas on top of the unit, mm -hmm. um, suddenly you're going to get a lot better coverage. You're going to get, um, you're going to relieve yourself of a lot of those those headaches where you don't have these unknown nulls in the in the in the equipment. Um, and especially, I mean, if you think about it, uh, a forklift that's you know carrying a couple of metal racks that extend over the you know past whatever PC you know those those uh, racks are also going to create. Uh, problems. So anything you can do to get that antenna a little further away from from that type of stuff and give it a little bit better visibility into the network mm -hmm. is going to be useful. Um, and then as uh, the second note there too is really truly understand your traffic flows. Um, I worked, uh, this was a warehouse that someone else designed um, and I was brought in whenever there were problems uh, shortly after deployment where it was a whole lot of you know very long rows um, they, what they had done was they had alternated. It's a fairly common design mm -hmm. where you alternate access points, one pointing, uh, so one pointing east, west, one pointing, uh, you know, west, east, you know, alternating rows this way. Um, it's, you know, fairly common design I've seen in a lot of places, but right down the middle, there was a, there was, if, if these were east, west, right down the middle, there was a north, south, uh, aisle that, um, that a lot of, that got used a lot. In fact, there was a small parts area at the very su southern end of that, and it was it was heavily used. And there was no um, design methodology or nothing thought about for that center aisle. So mm -hmm. whenever a forklift hit that center aisle and turned hard, um, that was where the roams were. That that's where the roaming issues happened, and that's where the disconnect happened every single time. So by going back in and reconsidering that design and and mm -hmm. ensuring that we had adequate coverage, and it was really interesting because especially these these um, these aisles were so long that whenever I surveyed that down that center aisle I could literally move six feet if I was if I could see you know kind of down the aisle mm -hmm. you know, I had absolute great coverage you know a neg neg 62 neg 63 something along those lines and if I moved six feet to my left suddenly I'm neg 84 mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a problem, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's a you know, and and especially considering again, those forklifts turn those aisles and they and they keep right on moving. They don't stop for a run. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of one of those things where you really have to understand. Again, it goes back to what Jen says: you have to talk to the users and you have to really understand: are they working in the whole warehouse? Are they working in a small area of the warehouse? Are um, you know what what are, what are the normal traffic patterns? And ensuring that whenever they get there and they make that turn, there's a there's a very solid access point that they can connect to and hang on to for a little bit. You know, there's a there's a great uh, thing on the on the end of the slide here is that uh, um, we love our acronyms, and, and I know a few people out there are probably wondering, you know, what is an IDF, right? Um, and uh, and and to follow in that question is, you know, you got an IDF and cable lengths and whatnot, but most importantly, and I thought we kind of covered this here is. Um, we often talk about LMR 400 or LMR type cabling. Uh, for most of those folks out there that are in that are doing warehouses today, it's important. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe um, uh, either Jen or, or or JD could probably explain is what what is the importance of making sure that you know the quality of that cable. Um, well, there's, there's you know putting on you've got like a thousand yeah. antenna, right? It's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's like different different types of LMR cabling. Some are thicker than others. There's like uh, lots of charts online that can explain the difference. LMR 400 is the most commonly used, mm -hmm. and there's a given RF. There's a given dB loss per foot depending upon the thickness of the cable, the type of the cable, and when you're buying the length of cable. Um, you're going to want to know what that is so that you can calculate what your power output from the AP is, what you're losing with your mm -hmm. connectors, because every connector gives you some loss. Um, if you buy your cable pre-made, the, the cable should come with like a, a given value for like, this is your cable loss for this length of whatever. But if you're making your own cables, you could be introducing more loss if your crimps are not tight, if your cable making skills are not mm -hmm. up there, you may find that you have issues with your homegrown cabling mm -hmm. um, that maybe wouldn't be such a big deal if, um, 
it, if it weren't, you know, the cable run weren't so long. If we're talking about making pigtails, then your margin of error, you know, maybe not, maybe wouldn't bite you so hard. Because they most likely would have, you know, predetermined lengths, right? Yeah. It's yeah. just those oddities that you would, would get into. Yeah. Um, folks, we're going to move on. I, but I do want to, uh, to highlight at the end of the slide deck, we will have JD and Jen's contact information. I know there's a lot of questions um, that are coming in for Jen and both Jen and JD related to polarization and some of the other um, things. So we will have their contact information. So feel free. I'm, I'm volunteering their time. If you have a question, you can reach out to them uh, and, and they'll help uh, explain or go into more detail on some of these, some of these other ideas. Just make certain you tag Tanya every time. Too. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> JD, you're off the favorite person list. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, um, so specific use cases. And, and today for this particular one, we thought we would, instead of um, talking about some of the, the biggest successes, because I think Jen and JD have really covered all of the things that, not all of them, but most of the things you need to consider in your design to be successful. We're gonna talk about some of the lessons learned and how not to do a few things, right? So take a little different yeah. twist on it. Um, and so, so Jen, we'll start with you. Um, with the, some of the things that you have learned how to not do things? Um, well, yeah, how to not do things. Um, be very clear when you're doing your predictive in ECHA how that you're understanding the, uh, the AP mounting height versus the rack height, like when you're designing and you're creating the, the mm -hmm. modeling for mm -hmm. the racks within ECHA how that you have to really understand the height from the floor the height from the ceiling so that when you're drawing in your RF obstacles, you understand the depth of the rack because mm -hmm. all of that, if you screw it up, even the tiniest bit, it's like exponentially problematic. So I would say that huge. And it's huge to, ha to have gone through official training because I have totally jacked up a warehouse design because I didn't understand that. And that's why I'm speaking to it. Um, and I didn't understand what you don't know what you don't know until you took, you know, until I took like an ECSE class and I was mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I did that. <laughs> I think we've all been there. I was going to say, I think we've all had that moment where we're like, yeah. oh. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah folks, no. don't be afraid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we, the best of us have uh, have been there. And it's all trial and error. And, yeah. uh, and uh, a famous quote by uh, um, someone uh, is, uh, we learn by doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and yeah. that's the best thing. So, Because I guarantee, I, I know um, everyone's first design is probably not what you would consider the very best design you've ever done, right? Yeah. And so we learn as we learn, we pick up tips, we have lessons learned, mm -hmm. uh, and we grow, right? So yeah. it's it's an art form, and, and we're able to we, to do that. We, to we learn from research. validation surveys. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. And is the client actually working? Is yeah, it, is exactly. it connecting? Uh, JD, what about you? What's something that um, you want to to share with us about a lesson learned? Um, well, so I spoke to it a little bit earlier, but the um, designing for the height that the systems will be used at mm -hmm. is important, um, but also surveying for the height the systems will be used at is important. Um, when it, one warehouse in particular, what that meant literally was me doing a floor survey, mm -hmm. getting on a lift and going up, you know, uh, 25 feet and doing a secondary survey and then going up, uh, I think, I want to say it was 44 feet or something along those lines was kind of the highest place that that the average user would, would be at uh, mm -hmm. and doing a third survey. And when you're looking at doing that across a warehouse that's, you know, 650 to 700,000 square feet, which isn't even a giant warehouse, but, but a fairly sizable warehouse, that, that takes a while. Those lifts move very slow when you're extended up. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot that kind of goes into that but it also will reveal a whole lot of problems. And at the very least, what you need to do is you need to, um, if, you can, if, you, if you know that everything was installed mm -hmm. properly, right, and, and, and consistently across the whole warehouse, you at the very least need to, to, to survey similar sections, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if, if the whole warehouse is, you know, uh, 300 foot long rows that go, you know, floor to ceiling, and that's all it is, mm -hmm. then do five of them, you know, and, and, and just kind of verify. And then maybe, you know, maybe go to the other end and, and, and check some more. Um, but more often than not, you generally have small parts areas, high racking, um, kit pack, things along those lines, and you kind of need to, to verify all of those for their specific things. Um, 
one other thing I'll throw out too it, that just came to mind. Um, understand understand the warehouse. It kind of goes back to the flow, um, but but it also it, it's about keeping yourself alive. Um, fit, work with the um, work with the warehouse management to ensure that you understand um, everything that you should be doing for safety and can be doing for safety. Um, though the the forklift drivers are very you they're, they're used to that warehouse, right? They know it, uh, you know, corner to corner, edge to edge, um, and and they they're on a, they're on a tight schedule. They're trying to get stuff done, which means they move very fast, and especially coming around corners. Um, you have to be careful that you're not you're not in the corner that they happen to be coming around. So what that might mean is if you're working on a lift or you're you're um, um, or, or, or maybe even just simply surveying, you know, pushing a, um, you know, pushing a, a cart or something to survey or walking, that maybe you're dropping um, cones at the end of the aisles, so that when they make that corner, they see a cone and they know something's different. Um, there's um, there's a lot of things like that that you can do besides just wearing the bright orange or bright uh, uh, green vest. Um, it's also kind of useful because I, I was actually in a warehouse one time where it wasn't on the row that I was on. It was one row over. Someone was putting a rack in at the very top. And mm -hmm. I just happened to look up in time to see that they were actually, there was a, there was a, there was a third rack that they were unaware of in the middle. And when they pushed that first rack on, it actually pushed the rack that was, and, and it wasn't directly over my head, but it was maybe 20 feet away. It actually pushed it off the top of the rack and it fell. Oh, and wow. I just happened to hear it, you know, I mean, it heard squeaking that did not sound normal and kind of looked up and saw it teetering. And I, of course, took off this, you know, to <laughs> ran as quickly as I could. And, yeah. um, and, and parts went everywhere. I mean, I don't think, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think it would have sent me to the hospital, but it would, it would not, <laughs> I probably would, have been would have had to clean out my pants <laughs> at the very least, right? <laughs> um, so there's, there's a lot that, that, that you have to take care of uh, yourself in those environments. And sometimes that means, um, sometimes that means doing exactly what the management tells you to do. And sometimes that means going a few steps further because, uh, because you are the oddity in that warehouse and they may or may not be aware, fully aware of, of where you're at and what you're doing. And I would also speak to, um, it seems like it's always been my luck uh, to, to draw the short straw and have the, the helper, the coworker that is afraid of heights, but doesn't tell me until we get to the warehouse. Um, I don't know if you found yourself in that situation too, but it's usually me that ends up in the scissor lift or at the top of the ladder or the top of the whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know exactly that feeling, especially so, when you get up so, to yeah, 35 feet. So yeah, if you're afraid feet, of heights, yes. again, three points of contact, use the belt, clip yourself in, um, take four count breaths if you are afraid of heights, and don't look down, three points of contact, and you'll pretty much be okay. You know, it's funny that you're talking about holding your breath. So I was uh, doing a tour. Four count breaths. Four, oh, count four, count, four count breath. Yeah. yeah. I, I was in a, a facility <laughs> and we were looking at the, the infrastructure and we were in a catwalk way high in the ceiling in a stadium. And it's, I was having like heart palpitations, yeah. like freaking out. Yeah. Because, like, and it's like, you're hundreds of feet up in the air. And I was and like, things sway, things move. Deep breath. Like the scissor yeah. lift, it moves yeah. and it sways yeah. and you're like, breathe. Yeah. Yes, fun <laughs> times. Well, and I think that's one of the things specifically um, that you have to be mindful about safety in th these environments. Yeah. There are, could be any number of things, not just the machinery mm -hmm. and, and the forklifts and the things moving through, but other, um, you know, there, there's installments where they're actually doing configs of, of products, you know, building, designing, metal shavings, um, power torches, lots of things. So you've got to be very mindful of your environment while you're while you're performing your surveys and while you're in the facility. Um, but one of the other things I think too. So you know, like just in general, what does yoga have to do with warehousing, right? Uh, well, okay. Exercise, I would say, I would, yes, exactly. I would say yeah. it has a lot to do with it because when you're doing surveys like this, they're incredibly physical. You're on your feet a lot. Hamstrings get really tight. I don't know about you, but my low back does not like standing on concrete floors for many, many, many hours, which is what you're doing when you're doing a mm -hmm. warehouse site survey. So 
I, I think that we tend to forget about needing physical activity because mm -hmm. we've just walked, you know, a million square feet. We've gotten our steps in for the day, but it's different. It's, I think it's much harder on your body to be standing on hard concrete floor surveying than it is to, I mean, downward facing dog, go upside down, get out of your normal change things up <clears throat> and yeah seriously and like do something good for your body other than your <laughs> i did my ten thousand steps yeah so yeah. It, it'll yes. help you have a healthier longer happier life if you do something to be the yin to the yang right mm -hmm. and if you're not used to it one of the things that you can do you know making sure that whatever facility you're at um, maybe you don't necessarily have to be the one to walk and do the survey if the warehouse has their ECHA license, you can have someone doing an autopilot survey for you yes. in every location doing that. And so that's one of the other things to, to make sure that when you're doing a design and you're doing a plan, if you work for a VAR or a system integrator or something like that, making sure the location has the tools that they need to be successful in, in managing their network as well. Um, and so I, just some tips, we've talked about some of those. Um, lessons learned. It's a balancing act, right? It's understanding inventory levels. It's understanding how it, how that impacts the RF in your design. Uh, and tenant placement, obviously there's so many questions related to that. And I know folks, we did not get to all of those questions. Um, but like I said, tag Stu on everyone, like JD said, um, and, and reach out to Jen and JD. Absolutely. They'll be more than happy uh, and or myself um, to answer any questions about antennas um, and then understanding traffic flow for for roaming as, as JD has been beating into us today. We need to make sure we understand that. Um, but any final thoughts, Jen, JD, um, we'll, we'll start with Jen, ladies first. Um, I, w I would say, yeah, you're going to have to, I mean, just because you think you know what the antenna does, be very clear on your azimuth versus your elevation, understand the, how it's going to be mounted, know, be able to visualize, like just because you're looking at the, the two-dimensional thing, be able to turn that into a 3D with your mind so you can understand how you're shaping the RF with the antennas that you've chosen. At a height, are you adding down, down tilt, mm -hmm. understanding where that RF is going to end up. Mm -hmm. And JD, what about you? Did JD freeze on us? I think you did. I but you know, one, kind of froze on us. one thing I would like to say is, is footwear, proper uh, footwear yes. that's, uh, that's, that's comfortable because if you're going to be doing surveying and design work mm -hmm. and sometimes you'd be covering a million square feet and that's a lot yeah. of steps yeah. and yeah. it's on a hard concrete floor. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. get yourself, um, invest in a really good pair of uh, steel toe boots, uh, especially doing warehouses. Um, yes. And because all warehouses are different and they require different things and different mm -hmm. types of, uh, maybe it's a warehouse that stores um, grain or mm -hmm. hot ash, right? Or something that's uh, a different thing and they require different types of boots. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. remember, get a hold of um, what the site safety officer has to say mm -hmm. prior to getting ahead on site. Yeah. Yes, yeah. ahead of time. It's really part of that methodology to get in there to get that understand of what, mm -hmm. what you need from a, um, from a safety perspective, because having the right PPE, yeah. everybody goes home yep. safe, right? Yep. Yep. And JD's back. And Yay. he's back. Right, right for the end, right? <laughs> JD, he knows how to work it. <laughs> tell, us, tell us about when you had mentioned about the, uh, the type of safety boots. You, you, okay. You had a yes. tip. Yes. Yeah. And he froze that's uh, that's oh, an important one. I think, um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Okay. Having all kinds of problems here. Um, so, Yes, I would say um, uh, spending a little bit more for, for high quality um, protective gear is important. Um, I worked in a position for a, man, for a manufacturer for five years. In the last year, they, they required steel toe boots or safety toe boots. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a large foot. In the U.S., it's a size 14. It's not easy to find uh, boots. Um, in that size, especially safety to toed boots in that size. And when I do, they're very large and very heavy. Um, the last, every year they, you know, a truck came, they paid for the boots. We got new boots. Yay. Generally the truck had like one pair of boots on it that fit me. Um, and this particular time, literally the last time I got boots from them, um, they had a composite toe, uh, boot that was made by, I want to say Converse or something, someone you would not normally think of for a safety safety shoe mm -hmm. 
um, they were fantastic. Um, going from that steel toe to the composite toe took a lot of weight off the end of, uh, end of my foot. Um, walking in those, that it, was a, it was a little more comfortable um, um, footbed. Um, and, and I think I might have paid maybe 20 or $25 more than I'd paid for the, the other well-known, you know, security uh, or, or, or mm -hmm. safety shoe companies, right? So it wasn't really that much more considering I was wearing them every day. Um, I, I think that's one of those, the, one of those little things that will in, improve quality of, uh, quality of your work life, uh, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. you, you'd be, it, you know, uh, when Jen said earlier, you know, you're, you're, you're getting your, your, th you know, 10,000 steps in. And if you're not doing that in something that is, is comfortable, you're a, either a, not going to wear it as often as you should. That's, that's, that's one possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, or B, you're just simply going to hate, hate your life when you do. Um, so, uh, so I think, I think there's something to be said for that. So folks on that note, you know, with Wi-Fi design, you never know what you're going to get from fashion tips to yoga and exercise tips to, to antennas. Um, we bring it all together here at Ekahau. And I think that's one of the things that's very, very cool about what we do is being able to accommodate and understand how to be flexible, how to, to, to have the right tools that you need to do what we need to do. Right. Um, and so with that, um, we will sign off uh, to everyone and thank you, Jen and JD, fantastic yes, um, tips and for coming on with us today. Um, absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, we've still had a lot of follow-up questions. We know we didn't get to them all, uh, but like I said, here's the, the contact info for, for Jen and, and JD mm -hmm. as well um, to, to reach out if you tag, have any questions. Don't forget Tony on every one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And me. Yeah. I, I said JD. it. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, and a lot of those questions we did actually yeah. uh, get covered um, as we went answered live. Yes. We may have not have marked them answered, but yeah. uh, uh, we, I think we going do try. through the conversations here and especially mm -hmm. in the chat window, I think we had a really good, and I want to give a shout out to thank you for the audience because it looks yes. like you guys have been very engaged yeah. um, yes. and answering and helping questions and even answering, you know, what type of enclosures some of those were. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, they are a combination. They could be Aventive, they could be an Excel text, they could mm -hmm. be any types of those and thanks for answering those questions in there. So this is really good and, and I and, and love the feedback. It's almost like we could do another more in, in depth on one of these, you know, and actually have a, a camera right down in the warehouse somewhere, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, uh, live on site, right? Live on site. Yeah, uh, on location, we'll to, sorry. On, on location, location yeah, right. uh, soon, yeah. hopefully soon. Yes, we can do just that. make sure you have your sidekick with you. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 I think when I look that way on my screen, I, I am actually looking at, at Tony. That I don't know how it appears. I'm, point, on I'm pointing at Stu right there. Yeah. So that, yeah. Yeah. Stu's, Stu's, I have Stu's down that, on yeah. my screen. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's like the Brady Bunch, right? It's like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and folks, right. with that, um, yes, we do. We do uh, have some some t-shirts to give away. We'll we'll pick some random stuff and awesome. stay tuned for social media for that. Um, there might have been a keyword or something we said during the the webinar that you have the first person to respond or something like that so so stay tuned um, to find out and with that thanks everybody bye thanks a lot bye, bye.